Schembechler, former head coach of the University of Michigan Wolverines, is still perhaps the greatest teacher of football in the field today. With a career win record of 76%, his teams were perennially ranked in the top 10 with 16 postseason appearances over 21 years. Truly one of the all-time great coaches, Bo now gives you the benefit of his experience to help you make the starting team. The purpose of this film is so that we can teach basic fundamentals and the important things about the game of football to that youngster who's just entering for the first time. Or for the coach who is empowered with the responsibility of coaching these young people. Or parents, parents that are concerned about their youngster going into a sport rough and tumble as football. This film is designed so that you can learn what you have to do in order to make that entry into football. We're going to teach them the proper techniques so that they can learn to do them with gusto and enthusiasm when they have gotten rid of the fear of contact. So there are a lot of things that we expect to get done in this state that are very important for the youngster who's just starting out in football. We want him to start out and have a great experience. We want him to learn the game the way it should be taught and then to have a great experience playing it. And if he does, Football is going to be well worth all the effort that that youngster puts into it. In football, you're always better to be blocking and tackling from a wide base. A wide base means the width of your shoulders. You cannot have your feet crossed. You can't be in a narrow stance. It's important for you to be just in that stance right there. Feet spread the width of the shoulders. Got his arms hanging loose. The buttocks is down, the back is flat, the head is up. And so we call this the fundamental football position. Fundamental to blocking, fundamental to tackling. All right, now let's take some time to talk about inline blocking, how our offensive line will block. First of all, we're going to teach it in reverse. We're going to show you where we would like to have a blocker at the point of attack, and then how we want him to execute once he is at the point of attack. Then we're going to back him off and show you how we get to the point of attack. But the important thing is to show them exactly where we want them to be when they block. First of all, remember, we are starting from a fundamental football position. This is the type of block that would be used by tight ends, by tackles, by guards, by centers. This is the way we would teach it. First of all, we'll put this man at the point of attack in a fundamental football position, right down in here with his feet, the width of his shoulders. His rear end is down, his back is flat, his head is up and off to the side of the man that he is blocking. He is up on the balls of his feet, flat back, head up, sink that shoulder up in there, bring those arms up, now, it is absolutely essential that he stays in front of the man and does not try to turn him laterally. We want to stay in front. We will block the defensive man where he wants to go. So on the command hit, he will sustain the block and drive him backwards. All right, are we ready? Tackling is to the defense, but the blocking is to the offense. A good tackling team can mean everything, and the technique is not difficult to learn, but it takes time. We're going to teach it in the same method we taught the blocking. We're going to teach it in reverse. We're going to show the player exactly where we would like to have him at the point of contact. Let me show you. We take the player and put him in to the contact position. He is in a fundamental football position. Shoulders wide, flat back, butt down, feet the width of the shoulders, knees over the toes, weight up on the balls of the foot so that you're going forward, there. Arms wrapped around, and if possible, grabbed. He may not be able to do that, but ideally, that's the position that we would like to have him in. All right, step back and let's do it again. Fundamental football position, Step into the block tackle. That is an ideal position that we would like to have him in. That is the first step 
in teaching tackling. The second step is how to get to that position. Now we back them off. Once they are backed off, we tell them to unload into the man that they are tackling. We want them, as they come in in that fundamental football position, to bring those hands right here to their hips and lunge and unload into the man, sliding the head off to the side in that same fundamental position and getting to that position with a jolt, with a jolt. And we want him to get into that position coming from down up. We don't want him just running in there, face mask to face mask, that isn't the way you do it. He aims with his head in the middle and then slides it off to the side and wraps those arms and gets into that fundamental position. Let's see that on the command, hit. Hit! All right. The snap is a very simple snap. There are a lot of different ways to do it. I'll show you one of the simple ways to do it. We put the ball down in front of the center. The center's feet are spread the width of his uh, shoulders. He puts his right hand down over the seams of the ball, and that seam running right down between the thumb and the first finger. I think that a young center ought to have his left hand on the ball. When he snaps the ball, he brings the ball in a pumping action straight up into here and slaps it into the, bottom, the top hand, the top hand of the quarterback. And then at the same time that he's doing that, he's stepping in the direction that he's going to block. The one position on the football team that has to be mistake-proof is the quarterback. He's going to handle the ball on every play, so there's always that chance for a mistake. And he must be the kind of a guy who's very technique conscious, knows exactly what he's doing, and doesn't make the big mistake. Some of the basic fundamentals that a young quarterback should know is, first of all, we have already talked about accepting the ball from center on the center quarterback exchange. Once the ball has been received, we bring it to the stomach so that we have the third hand to make sure that we don't fumble the ball. We are in a fundamental position with the feet spread about the width of the armpits and the weight on the balls of the foot. Basically speaking, we're going to end up holding on to this football with two hands until we actually hand it off or pitch it. There are usually two pivots that are used by a quarterback. One is a reverse pivot. Any time that you reverse pivot, you certainly want to put the weight on the ball of the foot that is the pivot foot. If I'm going to anchor this foot, I want to put a little extra weight on there and then swing out with the left foot like this in order to make my pivot. We call that a reverse pivot. If we are going to front out, such as going to the right, then I would have the balance of the weight on the left foot so that I could thrust with the left foot and come down straight ahead down the line or come backwards to hand it off deeper into the backfield. Either way, it is necessary for us to exchange the weight on the foot that we're going to anchor and push off of because we don't want a lot of false steps in here to make sure our backfield timing is good. Anytime that we hand the ball to a back, we must hand the ball and look the ball in because that back is going to make a pocket with his inside arm up and his outside arm here at his belt, and we must be able to place that ball in there and look it in, because we're going to ask that back to keep his eyes on the hole and where he's running. We want him to accept the ball by feel. If we do that, then it is up to the quarterback to make sure that that exchange is proper. He can only do it if he looks it in. Basically, throwing a pass. Proper grip is to grip a ball just about like that, and I can't tell you any really specific way to throw it because throwing is a natural action. Basically speaking, you should hold the ball high. You should step in the direction you're going to throw, and when you throw the ball, make sure you follow through with the palm down and out. Down and out. That is exactly the opposite of a baseball throw and you must be able to throw that ball like that if you're going to get an effective spiral and get the ball in the direction it's supposed to go. So here's what we do. We hold the ball high with a good grip and two hands on the ball, 
keep up on your back foot, step in the direction you're going to throw, bring the ball over when you do and follow through, and make sure that that hand goes down and out as you pass. That basically is the strategy, whether you go back in the pocket, roll out, or play action. If you're going to be a back, I don't care what you see on television, I don't see, care how you see other backs carry the ball, I promise you, the most important thing you have to do is to have leverage on both ends of the ball. That means that if that ball is up here in my armpit and my hand is here, I got leverage on both ends of the ball. I do not have leverage on both ends of the ball when it's like this. I do not have leverage on both ends of the ball when it's like this, because if they pull an arm, that ball's going to fly out of there. I have leverage when it's up in my armpit and my hand is here. And I'm going to run that way at, at, as long as that play is in motion until such time as I know I can't gain any more yardage by dodging someone and I'm going to get as much yardage as I can by bucking straight ahead. When I feel them coming to tackle me, I'll bring the left hand over the ball and I'll have security on both ends of the ball plus my hand as I finally get the last few yards. That is important. Leverage on both ends of the football. Wide receivers, there are a lot of different stances that can be used, and there's no one way to do it. In our football, we go from an up stance, highly staggered, the inside foot forward, and both hands down on that knee, and looking in at the ball. We look in at the ball, and downfield so that we can read the secondary and where they're lined up. And yet we've got weight on this up foot so that when the starting count is sounded, we can explode off of that foot and to get into our pattern. So we use the up stance. There are a lot of teams that get down in a staggered stance like this. It really, I don't think, makes an awful lot of difference. The only reason that we're up is that we feel we can see more, and that's particularly true if somebody's trying to bump us a defensive back trying to bump us as we come off the line of scrimmage. You cannot catch a football unless you look it in. Concentration is probably the most important single thing. That when that ball is thrown and it's coming to you, that you look that ball all the way into your hands and you put it away before you run with it. It's no different catching the ball down there than it is catching a pitch out in the backfield. You have to catch the ball put it away, and then run with it. And you must concentrate on the ball in order to catch it. We like to say that any ball that is thrown at us, where we're turned to the quarterback and the ball is thrown above the waist, that we'll catch it with our thumbs together. All right here, right here, any hook pass, curl pass, any time we're looking in at the ball. We want to catch the ball with our thumbs together. If we're going to catch a ball going away, such as I'm looking back to catch an outcut over my shoulder, then I want to use my little fingers together, like in this position, so that I actually form a backstop for that ball. And as that ball comes and hits me there, I catch it like that, I bring it down and put it away, and then I run with it. Same thing would be true if I'm running a deep pass, and the ball is being thrown over my head, and it's coming like that, I want to catch it like that. I want to catch the ball with my little fingers together and bring that ball into me. Now those things, I think, are basic fundamentals in receiving that every good receiver should know. When we discuss the care of injuries, we feel that it's important that we understand the significance of the letters or the name RICE, R-I-C-E, stands for rest, ice, compression, and elevation. When we have a young individual or an athlete who is injured, it's important that we apply some compression to that joint. In this case, uh, let us use the ankle as an injury. It's important that we, that we apply a wrap, which is our compression. This can be done, obviously, on the field.
Please note that I am wrapping from the toe up to the mid lower leg area. Then it is appropriate to apply ice over the wrap. Now, what are we doing? Very obviously, with an acute injury, we've got the compression to help decrease swelling that might accumulate. We are applying the ice to help with pain and to decrease swelling. And of course, we are elevating the extremity. So rest, meaning not using it, non-weight bearing, compression with the initial wrap, elevation we have emphasized, and our ice, so R-I-C-E. Now, it's important that all injuries can be handled in this manner, whether it be the knee, whether it be the elbow, or whether it be the shoulder. Many programs or many situations may not have available a nice ice pack like I've just applied. But of course, an instant cold pack that can be carried in an emergency first aid kit can help supply the same benefits that we have just demonstrated. The stance is the kicking foot of the right foot slightly forward, toe in step with the left foot slightly behind. Uh, bent over slightly, arms relaxed at your side. That basically is the stance to start with. Once the ball is snapped, be sure that you look it in, catch it with your eyes, just like you do any other pitch out or forward pass. You catch the ball and you extend it out as though you're putting it out on a table with the right hand underneath slightly, the left hand still behind the front of the ball over on the left side for balance. Do not put your hands out here. Do not turn the ball this way. This foot must come straight. This ball must be dropped straight. We don't want stepping off in one direction and back. It's straight lines and all of everything we do in the kick. As we take the step, we'd like to have a two-step punt. He steps first with the right foot, then with the left, and drops the ball from the table. When he drops the ball from the table, the right foot comes forward and is extended. This ball should drop right on that just as straight as you can. Don't turn it, don't try to twist it, because when that ball hits at the, at the foot here, it'll come right off, it'll hit there and come off that foot and spiral just exactly the way you want to. Don't think that you have to make it a spiral. And you snap that ball and follow through. All right, let's see that demonstrated once by our kicker. In the last 20 years, place kicking has changed a great deal. Most of our kickers today are soccer style kickers and have had tremendous success with a lot of different techniques. There's really no one way that we can say is the ideal way for a young man to place kick a football. But basically speaking, one of the really most important things in kicking is that you keep your eye on the football. So many times place kickers look up early and then they're not hitting the ball where they ought to be hitting it. The second thing is, the most important thing is a good plant foot. If you're a head-on kicker, that plant foot is usually someplace behind the ball. When you're kicking, it's usually behind the ball somewhere. But your sidewinder kickers or your soccer style kickers usually will end up with that plant leg even with the ball or even sometimes in front of it. How you line up when you approach the ball and how many steps you take depend on whether you're kicking off a course or kicking an extra point or field goal. But you must be able to plant that foot with some momentum and bring that leg through, keeping your eye on the football. And as you follow through, keep your head down and let somebody else tell you whether it was good or not. But basically speaking, if you plant the foot properly, Swing the leg and keep your eye on the ball. You'll have a good chance of getting good contact on the football. 
The square drill, I believe, incorporates a lot of the agility drills in football. We start out from a basic fundamental offensive stance. We bear crawl, we karaoke, we run backwards, and we sprint. And those things are the things that we think uh, generally teach quickness and agility about as well as any single drill we know of. So the square drill looks something like this. We'll start out with the man in an offensive stance. The first thing he'll do is to bear crawl to that cone. He'll carry Oka across to the far cone. He'll run backwards to that cone and then sprint to here. On the command hit. Okay, a fast R lineman can move on that. We know that they have the quickness and the feet that are necessary to be an excellent lineman. So we use this a lot, particularly with our offensive linemen. Other drills that can be used effectively with young players are the monkey drill. This three-player drill promotes quickness for getting up off the ground and is beneficial in conditioning. The gauntlet drill. Having teammates try to grab the ball away from the runner reinforces the importance of leverage on the ball. The fumble drill, a defensive drill that teaches reaction to a fumbled ball, stress movement from side to side and back and forth prior to the fumble. Hi, my name is Dr. Tom Tutko, and I've been a sports psychologist that's worked with children over the last 20 years. And one of the things I've become firmly convinced on is that the, every child should get an opportunity to participate in sports. I say this because I think that the physical, social, and psychological aspects of child development are firmly tied to the sports experience. I think very often we fail to realize that this experience, particularly at the age of 6 to 12, play a vital role in how this child gets an opportunity to be able to see the competitive world in later life. One important interaction that the parents might become aware of is that their relationship with the coach. I think very often parents, because the child gets involved in this experience, may have a tendency to one relive their own experiences through the child. Uh, very often the child is seen as an extension of child-rearing practices. So the parent might unknowingly put a little more pressure on the coach or give the coach more information or try to bias the coach. The child will be very aware of this. And again, it's important to remember that the child is observing the coach and the parent relationship, and it needs to be a positive one. One thing you might keep in mind at this juncture is the open communication between the two of you. The sharing, going to the games, the talking after the games. All of these things are very critical in having not only an open communication, but having the child feel that they're reaching their maximum potential. Now, let me just mention some do's and don'ts as a parent in the uh, raising of your own child dealing with sports. What are some do's? I think it's important to be the support system, to be there particularly when things aren't going well so you can put your arm around your child and say, that, hey, there's always another game. Another thing that's important is the possibility of sharing on a verbal level. That is, how much fun did you have? What did you feel that you picked up in today's game? What are you learning about the sports? Another thing that's very important at this juncture is to make sure that if the child has some particular questions or needs, you might be able to explore it together. Go to a game and discuss the game. Maybe getting a chance to go to the library, talking to an athletic director, talking to another athlete, talking to a coach. All of these are ways that you can show your child that you're going to be supportive. What are some don'ts? An obvious don't is, I think, yelling or screaming or making demands upon your child is saying that the sport and what the child is doing is more important than the child's own personal feelings. I think it's very critical at this juncture that the parents try not to keep from setting higher limits than the child might actually be able to attain. Parents often put subtle pressures on. Why? Because if that child is doing well, the rest of the world will see that we're a great family. How might they do it? by asking for extra practice, by making extra demands, by pushing when the child obviously might be in pain. The child becomes aware of the fact that after a while, there's simply a pawn, and what might be taking place is that the parent's needs are creeping in here, not the child's needs. In any case, remember that sport is a family affair. You cannot have a child involved in sports without having the whole family involved, the time, the effort, the money, and really the emotional investment. And I think support and maturity at this juncture is absolutely vital. Remember, this is an important juncture in your child's life. They're entering the really competitive world, and the sports world providing the opportunity for physical, social, and psychological development, and at the same time, having play and fun is very, very critical. And you as a parent 
can make a major contribution to that development. Parents and coaches should understand while you're watching the youngster perform in practices and games, they're also watching what your attitude is and how you perform. And so don't try to place too much emphasis on the winning aspect of the game. And don't get over enthusiastic about him participating in football. Because you've got to understand, if your behavior is not exactly what it ought to be, your youngster will know about it. And it'll have a very adverse effect on the way he performs and the way he acts. So I think it's important that all of you understand this is not big time football. It's little league football and it's played for fun. To conclude with, I think there are several things that we ought to mention. One is, and the most important, that we want these young people who are having their first experience in football to have a very positive experience, to learn the basic fundamentals, to have some fun playing football, and to be safe. Second thing is we want our coaches to have a proper understanding of the basic fundamentals and techniques that they ought to teach. The coaches should understand that everything they do should be the best interest of every individual player, that they should all have an opportunity to play, and that they should have fun doing it, and that we should not worry so much about whether we're going to win every game or not. That will come later, when many of these young people who are just now starting out in football will develop down through the years and someday may be playing in a great stadium like this and having tremendous fun playing before huge crowds. But that is not the purpose of this little league football. The purpose is to get the proper indoctrination, have some fun doing it, and to do it the proper way. I hope you've got something out of this film, and it might be worthwhile to bring it out every now and then and take a look at it again, because there may be some points in here that you missed the first time that you looked at it. But good luck to everybody, and I really enjoyed bringing this information to you. Okay.